first and foremost, if you don't, if you if you haven't got the list of publishers that we publish every year, you can go to our website at powellgroupconsulting.com or if you go to indiegame.business, it'll be right there in the top corner and you can just download the list. It's going to send you an email. It's got like 700 publishers in it. Um, and I have not used Zoom in forever. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay. So do we have a slide deck now? Yeah. Yeah. Can okay. We see? okay. So yeah, I, I, I will give a small intro. First of all, thank you, uh, Jay, for being here with us. Uh, we are so excited to to learn about this process, and, and you have a lot of experience here. So this is something very important for us here in Mexico. Uh, thank you, Hugo, for organizing this meeting. And um, yeah, so 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 that's it. Uh, whatever you want to start. Uh, and, and thank you, Caesar, for pinging me on Discord and reminding me that I'm supposed to be doing this right now. So, all right. Keep in mind, at any point during all of this, because there's a lot and we're going to go through it pretty quickly. But if you have a question, just pop it in chat and then I'll hit it up. If it's if it fits in, I'll hit it up right then. If not, I'll wait till the end and do it. But I absolutely want you to ask any and all questions that you have, because this is one of those fundamental things that gets everybody's games actually published. And, you know, with everything coming up in the next month, it's all very important. So I want to make sure that all of you have what you need and you understand what you need and you're good to go for when you sit down to do these meetings in a few weeks. So today we are going to, or tonight, we're going to go through five, six different things. We're going to go over what a CRM is, why you need it, how to take this list of you know, 600, 700 publishers that we have. And I'll go ahead and put the link in here just to be safe. Um, there you go. How to take this massive list of publishers, or even if you're pulling from another list of publishers and narrow it down to the ones that are applicable for your game, how to figure out who's good, who isn't, do a little bit of research, then very importantly, if you figured out who you're going to go to, what you're going to talk about, who you're going to pitch to, you need to understand who the people are, what they do. So we're going to go into how to find them, what to put in your pitch package, and then how to follow up post-show and get all of the stuff done. This is my constant pre-conference warning. You're going to come out of the conference if you have five or six meetings or however many you have, and you're going to be absolutely ecstatic. Every publisher has, going to, has told you that they love the game and they want to see more. That's great, but there's a lot of work that goes on after that. And you have to make sure you follow through because these publishers, when I was at Gamescom, I had 60 pitches that were games that were pitched to me during that conference. When you get back from that, you don't remember a lot. So it's very important that you as the developers are poking and prodding along the way and following up and just making sure that people remember you. So starting from that big list, what you want to do, and this is whether you start from our list or from any other list or whatever, when you're starting to pitch to publishers at a conference or outside of a conference or whatever, you've got to get everything organized. You have to be able to understand who you're going to and all that. So at the most simple level, drop it into a spreadsheet. I always recommend using a CRM. A CRM is Customer Relationship Management, to the best of my knowledge. Um, basically, it's a gigantic database, but most importantly, it one, it keeps track of all the emails back and forth between you and publishers or marketing firms or whoever else, but it also reminds you to follow up. And that is absolutely the key. I've been doing this for 25 years. I am, now we call it, I am neurodiverse. I have ADD. 
And you have to have these tools in place to keep everything going because it's when you're following up with 20, 30, 40, 50 different publishers, I don't care how organized you are, you're going to forget stuff. And so having a CRM instead of just having it in a spreadsheet is very, very important. We use Nutshell, but there's a ton of them. You could just search small business CRM. If you have heard of any of them, you've probably heard of Salesforce. Do not buy Salesforce. It's a gigantic waste of money, um, at least for companies our size. It's like trying to kill a fly with a sledgehammer. It's just absolutely ridiculous. And there's a lot of alternatives that are a lot cheaper and a lot more effective, especially for small companies. Um, you wanted to be able to hold at least a thousand contacts. I know that sounds like a lot, but it's really not. Once you get into this and you start doing this, especially if you've been doing this for a few years, um, it needs to have, like I said, that ability for you to set a reminder and then it's going to tell you to follow up because you'll get entrenched in something or more importantly, a lot of times developers tend to get tunnel vision. And it's like one publisher says, this is the one, you know, you're like, oh my God, this is the publisher we want. And you kind of like let everything else fall to the side. And that's a huge mistake because there is absolutely, I used to say, no deal is done until the contract is signed. But I, even I've had people sign contracts and then turn around and go, well, we don't have the money to pay you. So now I say, no deal is complete until you actually get paid on it. Um, so make sure that you all do not get tunnel vision. I don't know how many developers that I have sat down and talked to and they're like, well, there's only really one publisher we want to go with. We think they're perfect for our game. And I'm like, oh, it's Devolver, isn't it? And they're like, how did you know? It's like that because that's what everybody thinks. And there are a load of really, really good publishers out there. Um, and I'm not just saying this because my buddy Johan's going to be there. Um, but, you know, Rolf Fury is an example, but there's tons and tons of good publishers out there. Do not get tunnel vision. Um, if you are some of this stuff, it's like if you're doing just if this is one game, it's not going to be as relevant. But as you stay in the industry and as you work with different games, it's very important that you keep these a tag system so you can organize it. So our database is set up. So if we're sitting there and we're looking, a developer comes to us with a roguelike deck builder PC game, we can easily sort through our database and say, okay, we need publishers who publish PC games that are into roguelikes, card builders, deck builders, and do budgets under a million dollars. And it will abs just spit out the list for us. Um, that's what you want to aspire to at some point, but it's not something that's going to happen overnight. But it's extremely important when you're at these conferences, even when you're just doing prep beforehand, to make sure you're basically gathering information all the time. And that's really, really easy to do when you're doing like digital conferences, like our IGB one. I don't know how old this background is, but it's, let's see. A eh, couple years old. This is how often I use Zoom now. I haven't updated that in quite a while. Um, but constantly be gathering information and understanding what publishers are doing this now. A new publisher came out in the news. What kind of games do they do? Once you're meeting people at conferences, you can get an understanding of what their budgets are. But you want to be archiving that data in your CRM so you have it in the future so you know. And that way you're not turning around every year and a half, two years when you're pitching a project, having to start from scratch all over again. Um, you'll be able to take that and pull it into your CRM. Every CRM has an import function. And it'll, it'll basically give you a template CSV and you can fill in the information. And there's a lot more than you get that when you just get our list, but we'll, we'll go into that. Um, all right. So question. Oh, good one. On average, how many pitches are necessary today for a game to get funded? If you had to say a rough number, uh, if you're looking at a premium PC game, depending on the budget, I would say there's easily 100, 100, 150 publishers that are tar viable targets, not necessarily that are going to be perfect for it, but more important than how many pitches are necessary because you want to pitch to everybody. 
And this is, it's like when you're going and interviewing for the first job, like out of school and you're like, I don't really want this job, but I'm going to go interview for it anyway, because it's good practice. And that's the kind of stuff you want to do. Even if it's not just practice your pitches, practice it with each other and sit down and and take meetings with publishers and, and say, this is what we're doing. The thing to keep in mind, other than how many that there are is how long it takes on average, it takes four months right now from the time you send a demo of a, a, a playable demo, not your first meeting with the publisher from the time that you submit all the information that they need in order to make a decision to the time a contract is signed, you're looking at about four months and it has been creeping up longer simply due to how many games are out there and how easy it is to find everybody since COVID before COVID you know, it was the same forever. It was like, okay, how long is it going to take me to get a, a contract done? Three months. It was like that for 20 years. COVID hits, all the digital events happen. People all of a sudden have all these different ways of getting in touch with publishers that they never had before. You have publishers like Curve Digital who see 3,000 games a year. And that is how ridiculously competitive it is. Um, it's it's more about how long it's going to take once you get it in there and get going. Uh, once the contract is signed, how long for the wire? That depends on who your publisher is. Um, a good one's going to have it to you the next day. It doesn't take long at all to do a wire transfer anymore. Um, but that's in that whole contract thing on, you know, when are you going to get paid? Is it net 30 days? Is it net 60 days? That's a contract thing. It doesn't, the technical aspects of sending you money does not take long at all anymore. It's the legal aspects of it and the accounting and the bookkeeping and all that kind of good stuff. All right. So you've got this list of publishers and you want to triage that because you don't want to be sending your game to 700 different publishers. So you're going to start with platform. You start with the easy stuff. If you're doing a PC and console game, you don't need to worry about the mobile publishers. We're going to take them completely straight out. You want to factor it by platform, then go to genre. You want to make sure that the publishers that you're targeting publish games similar in the same genre or what we call genre adjacent. So if you've got an RPG, you also want to send that to not only publishers who publish RPGs, but publishers who had blah. Publishers who publish strategy games and simulation games, because you see the demographic crossover from those genres is very similar. So platform, then genre, and then budget. Reputation we'll get to later. That's like one of the last things we have to deal with. Budget is harder to get. You can go to these places like Steam Spy and App Annie, which isn't App Annie anymore. Now it's called Data AI, but the Google Store, iTunes Store, those are really good ways of figuring out which publishers are publishing which types of games, genre and platform-wise. Budget is harder because not everybody goes out there and says, hey, look, we only want games that are under half a million dollars or under $4 million. Or we have one client who doesn't want anything that's under $5 million. You know, it just depends on the publisher. The beauty is in the market today, especially, so we use Meet to Match for all of our digital conferences. The publishers can go in and put exactly how much they're are looking to what their budget range is in there. So one of the things that we frequently do here, even if we're not able to fully participate in some of these digital events, is we sign up for them anyway, because you can still use that meeting system as information gathering, you know, as to go in and say, and understand and learn more about each one of these publishers. Ours is, you know, 50 bucks, but we'll get y'all seats at our conference coming up in December. So don't worry about that. We're going to take care of all y'all and make sure that you've got not only the ability to do this research, but also to actually beat and pitch. But you'll be able to see if you're not, if you've never used one of these systems before, they're really, really good for information gathering. And, you know, we've got Jennifer on my team who I've worked with for almost 20 years. That's what she does a lot of, you know, even if we can't go to Pocket Gamer or whatever it is, we'll sign up because 
their tickets are like 200 some dollars or whatever, but sometimes even that's worth it just so we can get an understanding of who's doing what and learning, even if we're not doing, you know, a different deal or a pitch or anything like that. One. So when you're looking, and this is all still in the, you know, this is pre-production of pitching your game. You want to get this research done before you even get in the door and start talking to them. When you're looking at the different publishers, what you're looking for is are red flags. No publisher's perfect. Every single publisher out there has issues. You know, a red flag here and there is not the end of the world. When a red flag or two starts looking like a golf course, that's when you start having problems. And that's when you need to be, you know, paying a whole lot of attention and really understanding. Yes, you can go and you can see Google, a lot of these companies, you can see it on Reddit. You know, there's game developers are really good about, you know, sharing information and telling the world if they get screwed over. And, but they're also good at telling if they've had a really good relationship with somebody too. So you need to go and do a little bit of research on all these publishers. Once you get, you know, your list narrowed down, make sure that they are, they are focused on, or they're at least familiar with the business model that you want to do. If you're doing a free to play game, if the publisher's never done a free to play game, it's not a good fit for you. And the same goes, you know, if all they've done is free to play games and you're doing a premium game, it's not a good fit. So make sure that your, your business model is matching up. Make sure we, we already talked about the whole, you know, make sure that they publish similar games. I have a lot of developers that say, well, that's like competition. It's like, no, it's not because they're really good at it. You know, you want the people and the publishers that understand that genre and that market. Um, you know, how have their games been reviewed by media and fans? And this goes right along with the whole streamers thing. You can go to websites like Sully Gnome and, you know, a couple of the other like Twitch tracker websites and get an idea of how much visibility a game is getting. So if you are looking to work with a particular publisher and then you go and you start researching, you know, how have their games done and you go on some of these sites and there's like no Twitch activity, no YouTube activity, that's not the end of the world, but that's a red flag because what that says is that publisher doesn't have the access to streamers that they probably should. And that's a major way of how everything is marketed these days. So it's very important to make sure that, you know, when your game comes out, that publisher knows how to get it in front of the right content creators, how to, you know, work with them and get everything going the same day. So you want to look at it from that point of view. Metacritic is there, you know, game reviews, in my opinion, do not hold nearly the value that they used to. Um, there are simply too many games coming out for, you know, a lot of these sites to keep up with. And so, yes, the big AAA titles are going to get reviews, but I mean, at the same time, for all of us are also gamers. How much does that really factor into it? You know, we see FIFA get slammed every year when it gets launched and review bombed, yet millions and millions of people go out and buy it every single year too. So you want to, you know, pay attention to that because if, if a game comes out and it is getting bad reviews in the press because of bugginess and things like that, there's you another red flag because that publisher is not managing expectations, you know, with the testing and the QA and the localization part, right? Those are technical production problems that you need to be aware of, but you also, you know, need to just get an understanding of, you know, are the players playing it? Are they not playing it? And be careful of that vocal minority out there. And my two favorite examples of this are No Man's Sky and Fallout 76. Both games, underwhelming when they came out. No argument there at all, but they stuck with it. And so what you saw was the games coming out, everybody, everybody on Twitter talking about how they're complete failures and this is never going to last and the developers are just going to shut it down. But that's not what happened because the publishers, the developers are seeing the data on the back end. And yes, there's people yelling and bitching and moaning on Twitch, Twitter, but at the same time, there's still a lot of people playing too. And so you have to keep that in the back of your mind, just because everybody is up and yelling and screaming about whatever, 
game it may be, does not necessarily mean that it's like the worst thing in the world. You always have to look at the data side of it as well. Um, how are they viewed by consumers and developers? You know, do they have a good reputation? Do they have a horrible reputation? Um, these are, like I said, none of these are, nobody's going to sail through all of them, get them all right. But if there starts to be a lot of things popping up, that's that's when you start having a problem. But most importantly is this last point. When you're interviewing for a job and the, you know, the, the whoever's interviewing you says, okay, can you send us some references? You don't send them the references for the boss that you cussed out and stormed and threw the papers all over the table and, and left the office and never came back. You send them the references for your friends and the people that you know are going to give you a good review because you need to get this job. If you go to the publisher and when you're doing your, your research and you say, we want to talk to some of the developers that you've worked with recently, they're not going to send you to the ones that they had issues with. They're going to send you to the ones that they had a good you know, relationship with. It is completely dependent on you as the developer to go and do that little extra bit of research, find the developers that this publisher's worked with, reach out to them on Twitter, email, whatever. Tell them, it's like, hey, look, we're, we're looking into working with this publisher. What was your experience with them? Nine times out of 10, they'll tell you, either officially or unofficially. But you know, you'll be able to get an idea of what it's like. It's very, very, very important for you to do your homework and to really understand what's behind the scenes at these publishing companies. You know, I mentioned Johan at um, Raw Fury, and Raw Fury is a prime example. They are one of the few publishers out there who put their contract online. You can just go download it. And when they did that, they got slammed. I mean, it's just people were reading that contract and talking about how evil it was and how nobody in their right mind would ever sign that. Those of us who see a lot of contracts were looking at it going, not that bad. You know, that yes, there are things in it that, you know, you want to negotiate, but I've seen contracts that were infinitely worse. The people with the really horrible contracts don't put that shit out there on, you know, the internet for you to see until you've already got them in an agreement. So do your research, go behind the scenes. Don't just listen to what everybody's saying and do your research. Yeah, do your research. That's the bottom line. All right. No, no, we got some questions here. So, can you suggest a good indicator to identify if a publisher who has a big enough audience to reach something like the number of reviews on Steam and the games published by him? Actually, Steve, that's a fantastic one. You know, if it's a PC publisher, go to, I'll tell you exactly what I always do go to Steam, look at the last couple of games and see how many reviews they have. You know, yes, if it's like the, the mixed or the, you know, mostly positive or whatever, but more importantly, you want to know how many there are because there's not an exact science to, you know, guess how many units sold, but there you can get pretty close. But more importantly, if you go and this publisher published a game that came out three months ago and it's got 19 reviews, that ain't good. That's that's a failure somewhere along the line. So yeah, that's actually a fantastic, that's what we use just as a barometer, so to speak, to get an initial idea. Um, all right, so which market validation metrics are more interesting for a game publisher assuming a PC premium game? You might need to be a little more specific on it. What a publisher is going to do when they get your game, if they're interested in it, first off, it has to be fun. If it's not fun and they're not, you know, completely grabbed by one, the video that you send, because that's always the first thing they're going to look at, but two, the demo itself, what they're going to do, and I, we were working on one of these internally today is a comparative analysis. And so what we do when we do ours internally, because a large part of what we do right now is scout games for publishers. So I'm kind of here giving you the, the feedback and the response from the guy who's represented developers and pitched countless games to publishers for the last 25 years. But I'm also on the other side of that table right now. And I'm the one that gets pitched these things. We sit down and we look at a game and we pull up 20, 20 titles that have launched in the last year that are what we call comparables. And that, you know, spans everything It's generally based around the steam tags to be blunt, but it comes down to price point, genre, mood, art style, a whole lot of different things. And then we're going to look at how those 20 games did in the market and make some reasonable assumptions on your game 
from that. So at the end of the day, they, the validation metric that they're always going to look at is sales, number of sales, how it did, how it reviewed. How you get to that is typically through comparative analysis. You know, just like when you're buying a house, you know, real estate agent says, hey, here's the other six houses in the neighborhood and this is how much they sold for. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's numbers of sales. Um, we're still so steep all the way. Sometimes they ask for followers on Steam too. They actually ask for, so we go beyond followers on Steam Wish this is this is where I argue with my own clients a lot. So we will be sitting in green light meetings with a publisher, one of our publisher clients, and show them a game. And they're like, it's in early access and it's only got like a thousand wish lists, and it looks like there's only 20 reviews. And I'm like, so what? They're like, well, it's not doing really well. I'm like, that's because they're a developer. They aren't great at marketing that's what they need you for you know so wish lists aren't the end all be all yes if you happen to have a ton of them it's going to help your case but if you don't it's perfectly fine it's it's not it, it's what you're building a good publisher is going to recognize that your job is to make a fun game as the developer not to go and drive tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of wish lists to your game um so yeah Anyway, it depends. Yes, Caesar knows our, our podcast. Everything is, it depends. Um, Kickstarter, TikTok views is interesting because I think a lot of us in the industry, um, well, a lot of us older folks in the industry are still trying to wrap our head around TikTok. Um, it has been fantastic for indie devs. Um, don't ask me how to do it. There's actually, Crystal gave a wonderful talk at our conference earlier this year on TikTok. I had go and grab that, go to our YouTube page, watch it. Um, what we do is we put all of that together and we call it the social media footprint. And so we sit and look at, you know, how big is your, do you have an email list? How big is it? How many followers do you have on TikTok, Twitch, Facebook, wherever you are. How many people can you reach is basically what we want to see. The more, the better. But if you don't have it, it's not the end of the world. So don't, don't get overly stressed about it. All right. So ju jumping back to the topic at hand. So you've picked out the publishers. Like I said, if you've got that premium PC game, depending on your budget, you could easily be looking at 100 to 150 different publishers. The bigger your budget and the farther from release you are, the smaller number you're going to have. Because there's a lot of publishers that don't want to come in until like very last minute. And it's just, it, it's going to vary in there. How do you know who to actually send it to? First and foremost, if the publisher has a submit to us here on their website, always use that. Um, if you know people at the publisher, follow up immediately with an email to them and say, hey, look, I just submitted our game. That way somebody is on their side tracking it through the system. But the reason they have that you know, form in place and we do the very same thing is so it gets into that system and it doesn't get lost in my inbox somewhere. But that's rule number one. If they have that form, go to it. If not, here are just a LinkedIn. To me, I always say it's obvious, but I know it's not obvious to a lot of developers who aren't on the business end of this. But LinkedIn is an absolute key resource. You know, if you don't have a LinkedIn page for yourself and your company, take a couple of hours, you know, this week and and make one because that is one of the very first things a publisher if a publisher's never heard of you. They want to go and make sure you're legitimate. And that's like one of the ways that they do it. The other way is don't send a publisher pitch from a Gmail address. If you've got a game and you're ready to pitch, you should have a website. If you have a website, you have a URL, use that URL. Don't send emails. Don't send publisher pitches on a Gmail account. It immediately puts a little cloud over your you know, submission when they're like, okay, well, you know, are these people legit? Uh, go to LinkedIn. You are looking for business developer, scout, anybody C-level, CEO, CCO, CMO, the higher up, the better. If you can't find anyone in one of those positions, start shooting for the producers because the producers are the ones that are going to be championing your game internally anyway. 
but you always want to start out as high on that food chain as you possibly can. And so if you go there, don't, don't try to send them, don't sign up for, for LinkedIn in mail. Does LinkedIn is your resource for finding them. You can send them a message if you happen to be connected, but what you want is that name. You want to know who you're going for. Then you can go to sites like hunter.io or mailtester.com. There's several of these out there where you can literally put in their name in the company and it will either, if their email address is publicly listed, it'll just say, hey, look, this is the, here's their email address. You can email them. Or, you know, mail tester works in some of the kind of the other way. It's like when you can't find their email address, but you're pretty sure you know what it is, it lets you go in and test it. And so do that. And that'll help you find the actual email address if you don't have a card or some other way of knowing it anyway. Um, and send it in or, or do your submission. This is another one of those places where your CRM is going to you know, take into effect because a good CRM tracks the opens in an email. So when we send something to somebody, we can tell if they didn't open it at all, if they opened it once, or if they opened it like nine times. If they didn't open it at all, or they just opened it once and they didn't respond, obviously, if they didn't open it at all, they didn't respond. But if they opened it once and didn't respond... Keep in mind that sometimes it counts like an autoresponder. You know, these systems will show an autoresponder as an open when it's not really an open. They didn't really see it. If you email them and then you follow up once, you follow up twice, and you should always follow up at least three times, um, and you're not getting anything, it's time to find somebody else. It's time to find another way into that publisher. Discord is one that is so highly overlooked. Every publisher worth their salt has a Discord server. Join their Discord server up there at the top on the right where the admins are or you know whoever the higher-ups of the server are. Sometimes those are the scouts. Sometimes those are the executives that you need to find. If not, you could say, hey, look, we have a game we want to pitch. Who should we send it to? And they'll tell you. Discord is great for building communities, but it's also a fantastic business resource if you go in and use it properly. Um, all right, now the important stuff, pitch decks. And this is where it's going to come in, you know, in a few weeks. And so if you're taking part in the pitch thing, in the pitch sessions, remember, you got five minutes to pitch your game. Don't roll into my session with a 35, you know, slide deck because you're not going to get through that in five minutes. And you're going to get the little bell sound and I'm going to cut you off and that's going to be the end of it. Your pitch deck should have, 10 to 12 slides, 15 at the most, especially for something like we're going to be doing, you know, at the conference. What is it? Who you are, your game name, your logo, the overview. And so we're not going into 16 pages of lore on, you know, the backstory of why the dwarves and the elves are fighting. We all know dwarves and elves don't like each other. They've never liked each other. You want to go through the very specifics. Think of it as the top half of the Steam page. Genre, platform, price point, three to six different, you know, bullet points. And we'll get into the, well, the features anyway, because the unique selling points are, are different. And unique selling points aren't necessarily unique anymore, but we'll get into that. So the very high level stuff. And if you've submitted stuff to publishers in the past, and even if you fill out that form that, uh, that Hugo put together that has all the basic information. That's the stuff you need to know because that's what the publishers are going to see right out of the bat. What is the genre, platform, price point, estimated launch date, budget? Right there. The next slide is your unique selling points. And then this is an old term, bluntly, that's still used, but it's not. It's ridiculously hard to get a unique selling point in the market today. The difference between features and unique selling points, though, unique selling points are those specific things in your game that make it different or better than other games in the genre. Best example, the clearest example I can give you is Fortnite. Having a Battle Royale is not, you know, they were early in, they weren't first in, but they were early in, but now Battle Royale is its own genre. Jumping 100 people out of an airplane onto an island with no gear and you have to gear up. That's not unique anymore. 
those are, you know, 100 people onto an island, 16 different weapons, destructible environments. Those are all features. The unique selling point in Fortnite is that you can build your own structures. Although as an old guy and an old gamer, I am so glad they have that no build mode because I can finally play Fortnite with my son again. Um, that's what really makes Fortnite different. That's what makes them stand out, you know. All the other stuff is the same thing that you do in Apex, the same thing that you do in, you know, Warzone, all these other games that have been around for a while. You've got to look at what makes your game different than other games in the genre and what's going to make it stand out. Those are your unique selling points. Don't try to, I mean, God knows, if you can come up with something truly unique that no one has ever done in that genre, but it's not that easy to do. Um, store your background over you. Engage the publisher. Show them why it's interesting. Do not give me 16 slides of backstory. Look at, go to the Steam pages for something like Fallout 4 or Skyrim. And even that's too long, but we all know the lore that goes behind Skyrim and Fallout. But all of that's not on the Steam page. Little part is on the Steam page, and that's what you want. One slide's worth. Just enough to say, hey, look, it's not the same old thing. Here's what we're doing. This is why it's cool. This is why it's fun and engaging. Uh, your trailer or gameplay video needs to be linked in there. This is quite possibly the most important part of your pitch deck, because this is what is going to be seen in normal circumstances, not necessarily at the conference. In normal circumstances, this is what's going to be seen before your pitch deck is going to be seen. If you don't grab that publisher's attention in the first 15 seconds of your trailer or what the video, whatever it is, you're going to lose them. We look at too many of these things. So don't start your trailer out with a big, nice slow fade on the you know company name and then the game name. Nobody cares. Show us the action. Show us what makes it cool. Jump in and then put the game and the name and all that stuff at the end. We Yes, we want to know what it is. but no, not at first. You want to make sure that you are absolutely catching their attention right off the bat. Go and look at some of the ones. I can't give you a whole primer on how to make a wonderful trailer, but Derek Liu was on the podcast or one of our conferences, but we've got an actual a whole session with him on our YouTube page on how to make a good trailer. But do not skimp over on that part because that is that first thing that's going to get you in the door or not. Um, look at right now, quite frankly, the Steam Next Fest. There's so many games on there that nobody's going to sit down and play all of them. You've got to be able to grab the consumer's attention, the publisher's attention with that trailer immediately. Um, concept art and screenshots, two slides. Concept art, screenshots, not 15 slides of each. And keep it, you know, keep a variation in there. I always like looking at the original Star Wars trilogy. So if you have to, in your mind, think of the color palette behind, you know, A New Hope, and I'm old, so I have to remember that this is not like the original Star Wars. It's like number four or whatever now. But you've got sand on Tatooine. you got black and white on the Death Star. That's your colors. You go to Return of the Jedi. I'm not Return of the Jedi. Empire Strikes Back. It's green for Dagobah and white, you know, with Hoth. Return of the Jedi, once again, we got black and white on the Death Star and then green forest on Endor. Very much distinct all the way through. And that's what you want to show in the concept art and the screenshots. Don't give me, and I don't know how many times I see this slide, four or five different pictures of the same T-posed character model in different like locations. No, that's not getting anyone excited. That's showing that you can make a model no one's getting excited about that. Things that stand out, things that are going to remember and keep it short and keep it brief. Only the best. Uh, schedule and budget, obviously important. Make sure that when you're going through and you're building your schedule and your budget, you've really, really, really done your research. I don't know how many developers I talked to. I was like, okay, so what's how much money do you need? It's like, well, there's eight of us and we live in London. And it's going to take us 18 months and we need $70,000. No, that math does not remotely add up, you know, at, at all. So one, you've got to make sure 
from a production standpoint that you really know how long it's going to take to make the game and then add like 30% on the end of it. And the same goes true with your budget. The biggest mistake I see developers make in pitches is they come in with that, you know, when they tell me that there's a bunch of them living in London and it's going to be $70,000 for two years. No, but that's because in their mind, this is, they're still working nights and weekends. No publisher is going to finance your game with you working nights and weekends. When you build your budget, that needs to be a reasonable cost of living. Do not sit there and play that I'm cool as an indie and eat ramen for two years and think that's like awesome because it's not, it's stupid. It's, this is 25 years of me doing this. It's, you know, you need to make sure that you are getting a reasonable paycheck the whole way through. So make sure that what that budget covers is your whole team being able to pay their bills every month and preferably put a little bit to the side for the entirety of the project. The other thing that I see a lot in this, and somebody told me this at Gamescom, like at the end of the day, and I absolutely went off in the meeting, not necessarily at them, but on the premise at all. They show me this game, easily a million dollar project. And I said, so what's your budget? And they said $300,000. And I went, "There's you can't do that. There's no way. And they said, well, our advisor told us that because this is our first project and we've never done a game before, that's like the most we could ask for. That's so wrong. It's ridiculous. It, it, that is not a thing. You need that. The publisher is going to look at your game. They want to know if it's going to be engaging. How long is it going to take you to do it? And they want to know the budget. It doesn't matter if it's your first game. Don't go in and think that you have to slash your budget or, or work for like no money at all because you've never done a game before. This is going to be your first game. That rule doesn't exist. Go in and build a real budget. Make sure you have a livable wage and put that in there. And that's my end of the, I'll, I will stop ranting about, you know, indie budgets now, but very clear cut. This is how long it's going to take us to do. This is how much it's going to cost for bonus points. Put some designation in there as to what that money is going to. Um, company profile experience of team leads. And there's one on the next page too, that we're going to go to. Um, oh, wait, no, it's just those two. It's okay. If you've never made a game, you know, that company profile page, we're talking about, Hey, look, if you have a track record and you've done games in the past, this is where you put it. This is where you brag about it. If you don't, that's okay. Just say, Hey, look, this is our first game. Now, if you're the next stage of developer and you've never done something as a company, but everybody on the team has done stuff before, that's where the team leads come in. And the publishers don't care who all six animators are, or you know, they want to know who the team leads are, who's your lead producer, lead animator, lead engineer, lead design, lead audio, that they're not worried about everybody. And if you've if it's your first game as a studio, but your leads have experience, showcase that. And then if they don't, that's okay too. Say, hey, look, this is our first game. Yes, there are absolutely publishers that are going to go, okay, no, we don't. <laughs> We don't want to work with, you know, completely new teams, but there are also a lot of publishers who are like, okay, that's awesome. We can help you. And they will go through it, but it's all about being upfront and letting people know exactly where you are and not being embarrassed, ashamed, anything. This is a no BS industry. <laughs> tell us what you are. Tell us what you're doing. Tell me why your game is awesome and tell us where you need help. Because that's what the publishers are there for. There's a lot more to publishing than just paying the money and launching it on Steam. And so all of those other things that go in there is what is very important. That you let them know that you need or that you can handle or what have you. Um, all right. And so going to all of the market validation, the social media footprint, that's where, where all of this stuff goes. So you want to show the size of your community. This is how many people are on our Discord. This is how many people follow us on Twitter or TikTok or whatever. So have that slide in there. And then at the end, your contact information. And I know it may sound odd. It's like, well, I'm sitting here in this meeting with them. Of course, they have my contact information. 
you're going to send that deck to the publisher and they're going to show it around to everybody in you know their company and they don't know you. So everybody needs to know how to get a hold of you and where to go to see more and all this sort of stuff. So that last page, that last slide is where you put your company info. Um, that's your pitch deck. It really is that simple. Um, and there's some awesome resources out there too that will, you know, sample people always ask me, it's like, show me some of the pitch deck. I can't because they're all confidential, but I can tell you there are a lot of folks out there. There are a lot of resources out there where they have pitch decks that people go. One of the publishers, I don't remember who it is, um, actually has the listing of them, uh, but you can find those. So 10 to 15 slots. Don't be, don't be trying to do 20 plus slots. Um, once all this is going, help you go, how am I doing on time? I have been just like flying through all of this stuff. Um, we're almost done. Make sure you're setting reminders in your CRM to follow up with people. About a week each. It takes longer now because there's simply so many games coming through. Even on our side as scouts, Three weeks is basically what it's taking right now between the time that you submit and the time that I start having answers for you. Um, there's just a lot of games coming in. Don't harass them. Like I said, once a week. If they tell you it's going to be two more weeks, don't ping them again the next week and say, hey, is it done? No, they said two weeks. Um, pay attention to how many opens that has if your CRM is tracking that. And then just be nice, be polite. Everybody's busy. You're busy. They're busy. Everyone's busy. Know how long the whole process is going to take. And then you won't be as, as stressed. But don't be that developer that calls me and says, we need a publisher like in a month because we can't make payroll. Because I can't help you. Nobody can help you. That's the whole pick a God and start praying. And it doesn't matter which God you pick because the result's going to be the same either way. you got to be planning this stuff out. Um, yeah. And important links. And so with that, take a breath and questions. And if y'all want to do audio questions, we can do audio questions or we can do whatever. I'll go through these real quick. Um, what are monthly deliverables in a two to three year long project? Adrian, that depends on what your production schedule says. So if you're doing two to three month projects, yes, there are going to be monthly milestones that you need to hit. Those milestones are one, going to be fluid no matter how well you plan, but in the contract, they will be lined out. And that's where you're, a good production plan is going to come in. It's going to be certain things that you have to show every month to make sure that you're getting, you're staying on track. Um, okay, let's see. All right, a couple of things that go along with that, though. One, those deliverables are always going to change. Something's going to happen. Design's going to change. Order in which things are getting done are going to change. Make sure the contract that you sign has an allowance for changing that sort of stuff and that it's covered in there. Uh, and make sure that you're getting paid on time. So keep this in mind. If you've got a monthly milestone and that contract says that you get paid 30 days after the end of your milestone, which is basically what you're going to get from a lot of the big, big, big publishers because they have accounting and everything else. If you're going with a really big publisher, it can be 60 days. So let's just say it's 30 days. At the end of month one, you submit your milestone. Best case scenario, you're getting paid at the end of month two. If there are things that fail the process, things that you have to go back and finish, that's going to get strung out. You could easily be looking at three months before you get paid on your first milestone. So make sure that there are quick turnarounds on your milestone deliverables and make sure that everything is very clear on sign-offs. And it's like, if you are rejecting my milestone, you need to be very clear on why you're being rejected and what we have to do to resolve that. All of that is nuance in contracts that you, it's so easy to overlook it. And say, yeah, yeah, we'll get paid in 30 days. It's not a problem. It is a problem. This is where you need your attorney or your agent or whoever it is to help you along on this stuff because little things like that could end up meaning you're not getting paid for 90 days. Um, how much of an advantage is giving is pitching in real life summits in contrast to sending decks via contact forms? Oh, God, I love this question. Um, it could be an advantage. It could be a giant disadvantage. It depends on how, you know, how it goes. 
you always have the ability when you're in person, or even if it's doing, you know, you're doing a digital one, face to face video call, whatever, to engage and to, you know, make an impression on who you're talking to. And so they remember you. I had a, a what even a client, it was a friend of mine, was at PAX a couple of years ago, pre COVID, sends me a message. He's freaking out. He's like, my computer crashed. I have like eight pitch meetings today and I can't, I don't know. I have to find a computer and re-upload my stuff. And I went, no, stop, don't. I said, go to your meetings and for 30 minutes, sit down and have a conversation with that publisher, with that publisher, with that producer, whoever it is. Yes, you're going to talk about the game a little bit, but don't get wrapped up into going through your pitch, you know, one at a time. I was like, we go to these things, we as in the publishing side, the scouting side, whatever, and we're seeing 50, 60 games in three days. It's it's all going to be a blur at the end of it anyway. That's why I have notebooks full of notes from every conference because I know I'm not going to remember everything. But if you take that time to actually engage, have a conversation, to talk to that person, one, at a big conference like GDC, Gamescom, something like that, there's a really good chance they're going to be relieved and they get a chance to kind of unwind for a minute and relax and just be a person. And you get a chance to do the very same thing too. And I guarantee you a week later, they're going to remember you because here's the catch. At the end of all these conferences, we all have to have you send us your stuff anyway. So we're going to get it in the end. Having these pitch meetings is a wonderful example to make a connection, to make an impression. Remember me, I'm the guy who was 15, 20 minutes late for this talk because I was watching a movie with my wife and I didn't have this on my calendar. That sort of thing. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, Jay. Yeah, yeah he completely you know, almost blew us off there. But you remember that. That's the sort of stuff that you want to do. You want to make an impression. You want to have a person-to-person -person interaction with them. That's the advantage. It's not necessarily an advantage on you can explain the slide deck better or anything like that. That doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, do not read your slide deck to people. That will absolutely drive them nuts. But go through and the advantage is that person-to-person -person contact, not necessarily anything else that goes along with it. Because like I said, at the end of the day, if we sit down in a month and you pitch me your game, when I get back, I'm still going to have you fill out that same form because that still has to go in there. I still have to have all that information. So it's the it's more the one-on-one -on -one thing that is the advantage versus anything else. Um, what issues could happen when publishers are working with and looking at Mexico and Latin America? There's a lot of issues. Um, one, there aren't as many successful teams coming from that, you know, from that area. And that's why we're doing these shows as there are from, you know, the U S and Canada and Australia and, and Western Europe and all this other stuff. So one side of it is just explaining this, you know, Tell them about the culture. Tell them about your studio. A lot of it is new space. I mean, it, I've been doing business in Latin and South America for 25 years. And it still surprises me that it doesn't catch up. You know, there, there isn't more success out of it. You know, when you, a lot of times when, you know, you say, okay, look, we've got a studio in Mexico. They're going to go, oh, okay, Kerbal. And guacamole. And then they're going to start losing focus. It's a wonderful opportunity to say why they should be investing in studios in Mexico. That's the, the opportunity that you have. You don't have this deep, deep track record of tons of studios and tons of experience coming through. But this is the opportunity and these are the chances that you have to really boost that up. So it, it's not that they're going to have any issues at all, but they're just not as familiar with how a development studio in you know Central Latin America, South America works as they are with how a studio in London works. That's going to be one of the biggest things. All right. Any other questions? Because I know I went through a whole lot of shit, a whole really, really fast. And keep in mind, if y'all think of something tomorrow, you've got my Discord. You, you go to discord.gg slash indie game business. Email me. My email's right on there. 
don't think that you have to think of everything right now. Um, so, all right, Javier, that's a, a wonderful point. And this is what gets me. We've had folks from, you know, like, like the MENA region as well, because a lot of publishers completely overlook that side of the world too. And it's like, you sit down and you go, yes, this is how much more engagement that, you know, we have from our audience, but it's not getting the same level of attention that it gets, that, that other areas is get. You have to do the whole Michael Scott office thing and you have to explain it to them like I'm a five-year-old. Don't assume they know any of this. Say, look, this is the, you know, we get 20X views on our deck from audiences in this area. This is how big that market is. It's almost the exact opposite. So I had another meeting, another one of my meetings at Gamescom, and I know I keep talking about it, but that's like the most recent one I was at when I was getting pitched a lot of stuff live. And young guy doing the pitch, too much older, like even older than me, gentlemen with him that are obviously like the investors, the financiers. And, and we get midway through this pitch deck and he starts going into the size of the mobile game market and how card builders do in mobile games. And I finally, it was the end of the day, I was tired and I just put my hand on my shoulder and I was like, I know all this. Th this part, I know. Tell me what I don't know. But this, you know, I didn't know that you would get, you know, 20x more views on your pitch deck, you know, from that audience. This is just the opposite. You are very potentially going to be talking to people who have never dealt with this side of the world before. And so, yes, say that. This is how big our market is. This is how much more engagement we get. This is how much more passionate fans are. That sort of stuff should absolutely be in that social media footprint section of the of your pitch deck. Um, I wrote. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Uh, I have a question here. Uh, what do you think, or what's your opinion about the publishers? who are asking for changes on the demos. I mean, like, hey, uh, I, we liked it, but work on this and send us this new version. What do you think about it? I don't know, just my face cover right now? <laughs> or, I mean, here's the thing. Don't ever do specific work for any company, no matter who they are or what they're asking, unless you're getting paid for it. Okay. If you send your demo of the game that you want to make to 70 different publishers. And one of them comes back and goes, we would like it a whole lot better if the uh, female protagonist had black hair instead of red hair. We'll envision her with black hair. I'm not going back and having my artist redo a demo for one publisher. Unless if you have specific feedback, this is our monthly rate. We can splinter a build for you for this amount of money. If they're willing to do that, do it. If they're not, this gets back into that whole tunnel vision thing. Because I see developers do this all the time. They're like, oh, well, so-and-so said that if we you know, added four more levels to the demo, they'd sign us. Did they, did they write that down in a contract? Or did they just tell you that on the phone or an email or something? Because that second one has no validity whatsoever. If they want you to do specific work, they need to pay you for it. Now, having said that, the most common phrase you will hear at a conference after you pitch to the publisher is, this looks great. Send it to us when it's a little further along. That's fine. That's the normal. That's what they're all going to say, quite frankly. They're not asking for specific changes. What they're saying politely is, this game looks too risky right now. It's too far out and the budget is higher than we're comfortable with. But if you can get it further down the line, then we'll take another look at it. That does not mean they'll sign it, but they'll take another look at it. But if they're asking for specific changes, they need to pay for specific changes. Oh, thank you. Um, all right, is it easier to get prototype funding versus a publisher deal? God, no, it's a lot harder to get prototype funding than a publisher deal. Um, of all 700 and some publishers that are in that list that we have, I would say even liberally less than 50 do prototype funding. It's very, very hard. You know, that's prototype funding either comes to studios who have a big track record or have leads who come with big track records, 
or they are involved in some sort of incubator program. Um, Ivan and his crew are going to be on our podcast actually for the next two weeks. Um, and then Pontus, the folks at GTR, that type of thing. It's actually much easier to get a publishing deal than it is to get prototype funding. Oh, is it easier to get funding for the game company in exchange for equity instead of funding for the game? That is a, there's no easy answer for that. It's two different things. It's literally two different things. So on one side, that funding for the game company for equity, that's an investor. That does not always equal a publisher. Many times when you get funding at that company level, you're still going to have to have a publisher because they're just funding the company. They're not publishing your game. So it's literally, this is one side, this is the other side. And before you ask if I have a list of investors, no, I don't. But um, give me six seconds and, and I will... So my friend... Elena over at GD Bay, shortly after we put out our publisher list, she's like, do you have one for investors? And I said, no, because I don't deal with a lot of investors. She's like, okay, well, we're going to make one. And I said, awesome. And so if you go to GD Bay and fill in their little form, that will send you a list of investors that is like the other side of the mirror for my list of publishers. Anyone else? Javier, you have a question? Thank you. I'm sorry to ask so many questions, Jay. It's but okay. You're so smart and thank you Hugo, for the great event, everyone. So another question is about, um, is it, uh, do, do investors from a particular region maybe have a higher tolerance for risk? Let's say U.S. investors maybe have a higher tolerance uh, for risk in contrast with Chinese investors or Chinese publishers. Have you noticed a trend like that or is there no trend? It, it, it's not necessarily a tolerance for risk because even, so there's a lot of publisher, a lot of investors, even in the Western side of the U.S., there's not a ton of investors on my side of the country. I'm over on the East Coast. But, you know, we have a client who's an investor, but they only invest in projects, not companies, and they only do it at late stage. They're the company that you go to if you're, you know, at beta stage or later on a premium game, or you're about to launch a free-to-play game and you need money for live ops, or your premium game needs money for marketing. Every investment group has their own, it's called an investment an investor thesis, which the first time I heard of it, I was like, this sounds completely elementary, but okay. But what it means is, you know, they turn around and have investors as well. And so they're like, here's our problem that we're trying to solve. And they're all going to be different. What you're going to see is there will be somewhat, and it's not an absolute, but there will be a somewhat higher tolerance for you know, companies in their region more so than what type of risk it is. You know, you can have two different companies in San Francisco. Of course, they're going to look at, you know, West Coast companies, West Coast U.S. companies better more because they can easily keep an eye on them. And they're all kind of right there locally versus somebody from San Francisco investing in somebody in Tel Aviv. You know, that happens, but you'll see more of a, a tendency to go on a regional level versus, you know, more risk side. Uh, you have another question? For you? Yeah, if I can do a follow-up question. So something very similar in terms of this, let's say, higher tolerance for companies close to the investor, something very related is angel investors. Mm -hmm. So angel investors prefer to have naturally companies close to them. Uh, and it takes a lot of effort to find them. So does it make sense to make the effort, let's say, assuming that we are based in Latin America, to look for them since they are hard to find if we can pitch directly to game publishers? 
<laughs> whether you want an investor or a publisher, it's, it's really, like I said, it's really two completely different things. Um, but having said that, I would look, I, I, I will raise my hand and be blown here. I don't deal with investors that often. I have had a lot of bad experiences with them over the years. And so I'm very hesitant on that side. Hence the reason why I don't have an investor list. That's a, that's Alina's. But when we do look at it, I look at it in very the same ways that we do with a publisher. If you're looking at an investment group, whether it's a VC, an angel, series A, whatever, and they've never invested in a company in Latin America, there's your red flag. You, one, you're going to have a harder time getting their attention because obviously their focus is somewhere else. But two, even if you get their attention, you're, you don't want to be the experiment. If they aren't familiar with, and this goes region, this goes, you know, budget range, this goes games, you don't, and this is the reason I have a very checkered past with investors because the majority of the investors that I've worked with over the last 20, 25 years, see the game industry, do something fantastic. And God knows after COVID there's plenty of it. And they come in from another industry and they're like, well, this is the way that we do it in aerospace. I'm like, well, this ain't aerospace. This is video games. You know, this is, there are gigantic fundamental differences in the way that companies work and games work and programming works in our industry versus anyone else's. Um, you don't want to be that experiment. You know, if they come in and give you like ridiculous terms and it's, it's like everybody has their price, but the same way that we said, do the research on those publishers that you need to do the very same thing with the investors. And yes, there's going to be a red flag or two, but when there's a bunch of them, and if they're, you know, not necessarily invested in a lot of games or they haven't invested in a lot of, you know, studios outside of Vancouver or whatever it may be, those are all things you got to keep in the back of your head. Those are your warning points. Uh, Hugo, you have a question? Yes, uh, question, Jay. So for us here in Mexico, it's easier to look up north of the United States as our market target. Because uh, we are so close to them, it's one of the biggest uh, markets in the world. But generally speaking, what are, if there's a, a specific market that these days you know is trending for publishers that are looking for. I know Asia is big, but it's so hard to get into that market. So, are there more focusing on a certain type of market, or since Latin American markets grow so much? Is our publishers eager to get into that Latin American market or what are your thoughts on that? So I will say this, they are, but they don't know how. And, and it's like, we see the big conference. I've never been to big. I want to go, but I've never been. Um, it's been around forever. And, and there's a ton of wonderful companies down in Brazil, but you still don't see like wealth of games coming out of there that that successful publishers at the end of the day they want something original but they want something low risk too and so that's where you know mexico and latin america and, and south america tend to get put behind the eight ball a little bit it's not that they're consciously sitting down and saying we need to get into a specific market what they're seeing is we need to get great games and there are fewer opportunities. And this is the, I'm going to, I'm going to try not to go on one of my rants again here. This is the reason I started doing indie game business for whatever reason it may be. And there's a lot of them and I'm not, I'm not going to name them. There are sections of the world who have a hard time getting in front of publishers. And for the longest time, it was GDC because even, you know, as an American on the East Coast, if I go to San Francisco for a week and I buy that full access pass so I can watch all the sessions and learn everything I need to learn and then meet everybody and all stuff, I can easily be looking at $10,000, you know, if I don't want to sleep, you know, where I might get stabbed over in the tenderloin, you know, it's extremely stupid expensive and so i started doing the indie game business conferences 
because I wanted these studios and, and there's different reasons. It's like one, it's expensive for some countries Two, you know, Australia, it takes them a day to travel, you know, to basically any major conference. It's a long way away. It's more along the lines of they look at markets and they see very creative cultures, cultures with wonderful backstories that haven't been told as much as Vikings and, you know, the three kingdom Chinese stories have been told. And they're trying to figure out how to get it. It's the reason that Johan's like, hell yeah, I'll go down to Mexico for, for Gamacon. It's like there are publishers who see it and the, there are wonderful opportunities that they're not being, they're not seeing. But part of that is because it's like, there's only so many shows you can go to every year. And if the development communities can't get to those shows, they're not going to be able to meet with those publishers. And it's not necessarily that they're always, they're specifically looking for a region to get into. They're looking for great games. And that's what we want to do is find more of these great games and get them in front of the rest of the world to get you that leg up. So three years from now, instead of everybody saying, well, I've got budget for one more show. I guess I'm going to go to Nordic up in Malmo. They're like, you know what? We got budget for one more show and we signed a great game out of Gamacon last year. So we're going to go to that again this year. It, it, it's more along that line. You know, we need to get more opportunities for all these developers to get in front of these publishers and then take it from there. Okay. Um, Adrian? Yes, thank you. It's, it's very interesting, Jay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so some publishers ask for pre uh, playable. Some others ask for a prototype and others for a vertical. Obviously, a, a vertical is much more expensive to do. So do you have an idea about uh, how many deals are signed based on just a playable or prototype? Do, do you want to know the, the, the bigger answer to that question, Adrian? Ask all those publishers to define what each one of those is they won't be able to do it. They, they, even, I mean, there's tons of arguments over what exactly is a vertical slice and then what is that playable or what is, you know, the, the prototype and everything. Prototype generally infers it's earlier along. We're talking like an alpha state, something like that. Vertical slice playable, those terms get tossed around so much together that it's honestly hard to sit down and say which is which. Here's the deal. You need to be able to show, you know, when we go back to that slide and it says, here's the things that make your game stand out in the genre, your, your playable vertical prototype, whatever you want to call it, your demo needs to show those things. Even if it's like in a limited method, however it wants to do. There was a game that we were talking about last week on the show, and I cannot remember what it was. It's one of the old school games and it starts you out when the game starts you are like max level absolutely laying waste to every enemy on the battlefield and then it kills you and you got to go back and you build you have to build yourself back up but for that first five minutes you got to see how awesome your character was towards the end of the game and the goal you were going for it's like that it's i don't ever want to get into trying to define what each one of those are, because if you go to every single publisher, they're going to have a different definition for every single one of them. You need to show why your game is fun and why it is engaging in that demo, however you choose to do it. But that's what's going to get it. Make sure that they see a trailer, see a video that goes, oh my God, I need to play this. And then when they play it, no matter how long, no matter how short it is, Make sure that it, they walk away from it going, I get it. I know exactly what they're doing. I know exactly where they're going with this. We'll go from there. But it's honestly really, really hard. I mean, there I couldn't tell you the stats on it because everybody's got something completely different. And, and then on top of that, it, you know, I always tell de developers, don't try to build to a specific type of publisher that you want to work with. I guarantee you, no matter what you come to the table with, there is a publisher out there that fits what you've got, you know, when it comes to budgets or whatever. If you come in and you go to 100 different publishers and you say, my budget is 
you're going to miss out on a bunch of them because they don't deal with anything under 5 million and you're going to miss out on a bunch more because they don't deal with anything over half a, you know, half a million. So there's so many different publishers that are out there and things that they want to see and all of this stuff that it's easy to get lost in the weeds of it. Show them the game that you want to make, show them the game that you're passionate about and make it clear in that demo. Don't worry about what they call the demo. Don't worry about any of that sort of stuff. Just make sure that they walk away and they're engaged because that's the, that's what's going to matter at the end of the day. I said my claim, well, my claim to fame, but back in the day, I sold a multi-million dollar project based on an AVI, that's how long ago it was, of a mirror cube bouncing down a hallway. And it was a first-person shooter. But at the time, that was so technically impressive that the publisher was like, okay, yeah, we're in. Whatever the game is, that looks fantastic. We're going to go from there. It's hard to do it like that anymore, but it's always going to depend on who the publisher is. Don't worry about your game and making it fun and showing people why it's awesome. Don't worry about anything else. Everything else will come, everything else will fall in place. Thank you. I think there is a question from Cesar on the chat. Uh, which publisher could you recommend to look at for small retro Tetris attack games for small puzzle games? You can't ask me that live. That's what I get paid to do, Caesar. Um, honestly, I'd, I'd have to go through. When, when we look at games like that, we have to go through the same process I walked all y'all through because all this stuff changes so often. Keeping that publisher list up to date is literally a year-long thing. Um, here's what I would say. Simply go on, depending on your platform, either go on iOS or Android or go on the Steam store, find your similar games and see who's publishing them. And we used to do that at retail. And on it, that's honest. That's your quickest way of finding your best targets. Um, there are many game investors opposed to the U.S. to look less risky for them. Does it help to have a studio incorporate? Oh, my God. The Delaware Corporate LLC. Um <laughs> I'm not even incorporated in Delaware. I probably should be for some tax reason that I don't even understand. Um, no, I mean, it's it's one of those things that matters to tax people. The only thing, all right, so I, I will say it, it, it does matter. It's not going to matter to you. It matters to us in the U.S. I cannot legally deal with a company in Iran. I cannot keep legally deal with a company in Russia right now. Now, what you will notice is a lot of the companies that are in Russia or in Iran are actually in Cyprus. That's where, that's what matters as much. What they want to know is that you are actually a company. That's what is important. Not what your tax filing is. I couldn't even tell you what the tax filings, especially like in Mexico are. I'm doing good to figure out. I have a, an accountant that does my tax filings. I know I'm an S Corp LLC. That's it. It, it. They just want to know that you're a real company. That's the that's the main thing. Mario. Hey Jay, uh, we're the the guys from from Candlelight. I don't know if you remember us, but. Um, uh, but, so the question that I had is that we recently had a demo available for for the game for Candlelight and. Uh, what 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 is your opinion on this? When you have a demo available available on Steam for everyone to see, uh, is it better to direct publishers to that demo on Steam, or would it be better to make uh, like a, a a build that's like uh, like publisher oriented? So I'm going to answer your question with an answer with a question. Why would you build a separate demo that you're not showing to everyone just for the publishers to look at? You're making a lot more work for yourself if you do that. If you've got, you know, if Canonite's been up there and the build's stable and you, you haven't updated the build on Steam, but it's been several months and you have a new build, then yeah, send them that one. But don't go, if, if you're a 200 purchase studio that can do things like Activision does where they work on a game for two years and then go, eh, we don't like it, we're going to kill it. 
if you have that much money and that many people in the studio that you can afford to do splinter versions of demos, then yeah, by all means, knock it out and do it. But we don't live in that world. We live in the indie developer world where, you know, you don't have that kind of resources. So if you've got something, if, if the version on Steam is the most recent, especially if you want to point them to Steam, because one, it's easier for you as the developer, trust me, than updating, you know, drop boxes and FTPs and everything else. It's like, here, here's a Steam code. There you go. Um, if that's the most recent version, send them that one. Plus it makes you look, you know, if your Steam page is set up well, it makes you look better. If there's something like months later, that's much further along and you just haven't needed to update this thing one, then send them that one. But don't go down that route of building specialized builds for publishers. Um, here, I, I will second the question from Mario because that happened for us. Uh, we we direct the fund, uh, people from pl uh, funding platforms and publishers to the Steam demo and a couple of them asked for a, a complete build for the game. They say, hey, we can sign an NDA and and send us the, the, the complete build for the game. And uh, what do you think about it? Do you have a complete build of the game? Uh, well, uh, in that moment, it was close, close to, to be a, uh, a complete build, uh, but yeah, no 100%. I mean, if you have it, like my point is don't go do a whole lot of extra work for somebody who hasn't signed a contract with you. If it's something that you have, then yeah, there's no, there's no harm in it. Yeah. Because they're going to keep asking for stuff anyway until the, this is the game publishers play, play. It's like, Steve, this looks really interesting, but show it to me when you have a little, when it's a little further along or send me the complete build or hear me, whatever. They're going to keep doing that until they either know for a hundred percent that they don't want to publish your game or they know 100% that they do want to publish it, or they're pretty sure they want to, but they think somebody else is going to get it, and then they do it. So if, yes, if you have more complete versions, then there's no harm in sending it on. Yes, absolutely do it. But don't go and, you know, work yourselves to death for a month straight just to build one. Tell them that, you know, it'll be ready. What what I love about my job is I get to meet you know studios like you all. They're like, well, we should send them this bigger bill, and and I'm like, okay, that's great, and and that's passion, and just be tempered. And then I talk to developers that are like, hey, we're not really looking for a publisher right now. Call us in like six months, and I'm like, I know you don't have investors. I know you have no money coming in, but everybody's got a different look on it and there's not like a, a particular one that works i mean i'll tell you from the publishing standpoint and from the scouting point you know being told that just wait six months is like ah but i know i want it now but it, it, it's one of those things that yes if you have it publishers are going to continue to ask for more until they sign the contract if you have it yes send it but if if it's something that you've got to go out of your way and it's going to inhibit you know, what the team is doing on, on the core build, then no, not unless they are willing to pay you to do it. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Jay. Uh, <laughs> maybe just hope there's more stuff, but it looks crappy for the general public. So here's your question. If it looks crappy for the general public, it's going to look crappy for the publisher too. Don't buy into that story about, oh, publishers don't care what it looks like. <laughs> Yeah, the hell they do. They absolutely do. If you send them something and, you know, it just looks like crap, that's their takeaway because they see so you're, you're dealing with a highly, highly, highly competitive marketplace. So if you're conscientious about sending it out to the public, why are you sending it to the publisher? Just think through that. Is there, a, is there a calmer time of the year? No. Um, there, there used to be. Not anymore. Um, I would say when it comes to pitching games, it's harder to do in the summer because there are so many conferences. The November and December are actually pretty good times, not necessarily to get a deal done, 
but to start laying the groundwork for it. Because if we still live in, it's like retail isn't nearly as part of our industry as it used to be, but we still all have that mindset. It's like, okay, mid-October, everything's got to be done for Black Friday and I'm tuning out for the rest of the year. And it's not reality anymore, but a lot of people do that. And so you start to see things slow down and getting signed. But that is a fantastic time to be building relationships with these people, even if they're not going to sign it. Let them play it. We all sit around and play games all the time. It's a matter of, you know, are we traveling or not? And yes, summer is harder because there are so many conferences going on, but there's no calm time of the year. Trust me. I, I know that one. Um, so, sorry here. Uh, we have to stop a recording this call. We can continue if, if you are uh, okay with it. But uh, for now, we have to stop uh, the recording. I, I can go 10, 15 more minutes. Thank I, you very much. So My, my just, wife hasn't yelled at me yet. I don't think she has anyway. <laughs> so I'm going to stop the recording and then we continue the conversation off topic. How's that sound? Great. Yes.